was this coronavirus um, lurking in animals for hundreds of years before it jumped to humans? Uh, in this case, we know that the ancestor of this coronavirus was seen in bats before. And bats are uh, one of the major reservoirs of coronaviruses. Most uh, importantly, the type of coronavirus, uh, which we see uh, in case of SARS-CoV-2, also SARS-1 and MERS, uh, which are beta, beta coronaviruses. This virus needed to mutate to be able to jump to humans, to infect humans. Uh, before uh, coron this coronavirus, the ancestor of this coronavirus was probably just living, uh, living, was probably just uh, uh, in animals. And uh, these animals probably were co-evolving with it for uh, millions of years. Uh, and because of that, uh, probably they didn't have symptoms upon infection because that's how reservoir species works. Uh, after long coevolution between uh, viruses, we, between uh, pathogens and uh, animals, we don't see symptoms upon infection because obviously virus uh, shouldn't kill its host if it wants to spread. And if it won't spread efficiently, uh, it will just die off uh, because viruses cannot exist without a host. So after long coevolution, we see this uh, lower pathogenicity uh, in reservoir hosts. So probably the ancestor of this coronavirus was in uh, animal species, uh, which were reservoirs for millions of years. Uh, and then uh, there were some mutations uh, which make it more uh, efficient with infecting other species and humans. And that's how we got SARS-CoV-2. How likely is it that a pangolin was the intermediary host between bats and humans? Could it have been another animal? Yes, and we've seen that before uh, with SARS-1 and MERS, which are other coronaviruses we've seen uh, also jumped from animals to humans. Uh, and with both SARS-1 and MERS, uh, we suspect that there was some intermediate species between bats uh, and humans. So there was bat, intermediate species, uh, uh, species and, and human. And the same probably happened with SARS-CoV-2 because uh, with uh, the coronavirus we've seen in bats, there are similar to SARS-CoV-2, but not 100% uh, similar. Obviously, there are some changes. Uh, and uh, with pangolins, we also seen similar coronaviruses in pangolins. The problem with pangolins is that uh, the coronaviruses we've seen in them um, made them sick. Uh, and that shouldn't happen with reservoir species, because as I, as I said before, the long-term coevolution makes uh, the pathogen less, uh, show more symptoms upon infection. It doesn't uh, kill the host. It, sh it should be more asymptomatic infection than anything. And coronaviruses, which we've seen in pangolins, tend to make them sick and kill them. Uh, and that's not how uh, reservoir species work. Uh, also, only one protein of, uh, of coronaviruses we've seen in pangolins uh, is uh, like more than 90% similar to SARS-CoV-2. And these should be a bit uh, bigger proportion of the genome uh, to really say that that's, that's probably the intermediate species. So still, this is unresolved. Uh, we still don't know what was uh, which species was the intermediate species there, uh, and we are still looking. Uh, and at the moment, uh, it's really hard to say because obviously uh, we know that it probably uh, came from the wet markets where there is a lot of different animals uh, and it can be anything at the moment. It might have been also just a bat and it jumped from a bat to human. There might not be even an intermediate species there, but uh, it will be very hard to say right now uh, with no uh, samples available to uh, from all these animals to just check uh, to say which animal was intermediate species, especially that even with Ebola uh, after the big uh, epidemic uh, in Africa, we still don't know what was uh, the, the reservoir species which started it.
Do you think we'll ever know who patient uh, zero is? Uh, that's that's the same question like with uh, with the uh, preservoir species there it will be very hard after such a long time to find it especially that pandemics have uh, like certain stages the first stage uh, most of the pandemics not all of them because each pandemic is slightly different but most of the pandemics uh, have certain stages the first stage is when the uh, when the pathogen is spreading, uh, but uh, we cannot see that. Uh, we uh, Only the later stage, when we see the sudden spike in infections, uh, we can observe. But before that, there is always a stage where we cannot really see the pathogen because it's spreading in very small uh, communities, for example, or in uh, not that many people, only after we see the surge in infections, uh, then we know uh, that something is happening. So there might be uh, that the patient zero, uh, we will never know when who the patient zero was or where was it really. So you think it's hard to, to actually track down the source of this pandemic? So it, we might never be in a situation where we can say one way or another that it did or it didn't leak from the Wuhan lab. <laughs> yes, although we know right now that uh, there is more evidence pointing at the natural uh, source of this infection than the uh, leak from the lab. Uh, and we've seen that before with other, other coronaviruses, other pandemic, epidemic coronaviruses like SARS, MERS, uh, which I mentioned before. Uh, these viruses tend to uh, jump from animals to humans, and that happens naturally, and that's nothing unexpected. Uh, scientists expected the pandemic caused by coronavirus for right now more than several years. We have uh, research, we have uh, papers on that. Uh, so it's not, not something unexpected. Let's get on to mutations. How, uh, how scary could the recombination of two coronavirus variants be? Um, and could it render the current crop of vaccines completely useless? Coronaviruses uh, do recombine sometimes, but that does not happen as often as with other viruses. It can happen. But, uh, but it's a bit more complicated than, for example, with uh, influenza. Uh, and uh, yes, that will be quite uh, dangerous. That can change the whole parts of the proteins uh, of the virus, which can then render vaccines, uh, uh, well, inefficient. So that's, uh, that's something which we, probably should, uh, should look out for. But again, uh, coronaviruses don't, uh, they don't uh, change uh, on the same level as, as influenza, they don't recombine uh, like that often. Uh, I don't think that at the moment uh, we should expect that will happen. Uh, so it is, it is possible, but I don't think it is very probable. Do, should we panic every time that we discover a new variant or is it is this just part and parcel of life for the foreseeable future? Uh, I don't think we should panic. Uh, we should for sure uh, observe them uh, to see how the uh, virus uh, dynamics uh, uh, progresses. Uh, but we shouldn't panic because that will happen. We knew that it will happen sooner or later that we see uh, new variants which will have mutation which can change the characteristics of the virus like transmissibility, like uh, evasion uh, from uh, immunity, or our immune system. So we knew that will happen. And in fact, uh, this coronavirus is uh, evolving, mutating slower than we expected from this kind of viruses. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't panic for sure, uh, we should uh, be cautious, uh, but uh, we will see new mutations and we will see new variants, uh, that's, that's not anything unexpected. How troublesome is the E484K mutation in terms of getting back to normal life? Will it eventually crop up everywhere? <laughs> 
this mutations, uh, mutation was observed before in South African variant, uh, the variant from Brazil, and right now Nigerian variant. Also, uh, it appeared in few uh, samples with uh, the Kent variant. Uh, so it seems that it's uh, that mutation uh, helps the virus somehow. So uh, it appears more and more. Uh, of course. Uh, this mutation also was found to help the virus evade natural and vaccine-induced uh, immunity. Uh, although we need to remember that uh, it doesn't mean that it makes the vaccines uh, or our uh, immune response uh, totally uh, ineffective. It's uh, it's only lowers uh, these. Uh, uh, this immune response lowers the uh, antibody uh, efficiency in uh, neutralizing the virus. So uh, still, uh, vaccines, uh, even uh, against these uh, the variants with these mutations, still vaccines are effective. Still, uh, should help us to avoid severe, uh, severe disease uh, or hosp hospitalization and death from COVID nineteen. Uh, we need to remember that vaccines. Uh, just the levels of antibodies after vaccinations are very, very high. Uh, and even uh, the virus with this mutation wouldn't uh, escape through all of, uh, from all of them. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, what is interesting is that this mutation uh, appears more and more in different variants, which means uh, that which helps us because we can predict, uh, we know this mutation and we can predict that probably uh, it will uh, how the virus will mutate further. So that's that's a good news uh, because right now we can uh, see the progression of the evolution of this virus. Um, and also, how important is T cell immunity in the fight against coronavirus? So that's a very good question because we found out that uh, the T cell immunity. Uh, is probably more important than antibody immunity uh, uh, right now with the coronaviruses. Antibodies are uh, one of the like first line of defenses uh, when it goes to a virus or pathogen, uh, infections with, with viruses or pathogens. Uh, T cells uh, are more important because they are these uh, immune uh, memory so they can remember the uh, the pathogen, uh, and but they're also much harder to detect. That's why uh, most of our tests uh, after vaccinations, after after uh, infection, uh, is based on antibodies because they are much easier to detect and to say if somebody uh, went through infection or or had uh, or have like uh, immunity. To the uh, to the virus after vaccination, so that's that's easier for us to detect. T cells are not that easy, uh, and the samples to detect T cells, which will tell us if somebody is still uh, has immune memory and is still immune to a coronavirus infection, uh, needed to be taken. Uh, needed to be taken and analyzed almost uh, immediately, which is obviously quite of a logistical uh, problem there. Uh, so uh, we cannot really tell uh, how T cell memory uh, at the moment works against uh, in uh, in case of infection or in case of vaccination, but we know that's probably much more important uh, and most evidence points uh, at T cells uh, as the major uh, defense against coronaviruses right now, uh, which is also good because that probably means that our uh, immune memory lasts much longer uh, than we expected in the beginning. So T cells seem to be the major line of defense there and even the low uh, levels of antibodies doesn't mean uh, that we uh, won't produce new antibodies uh, if we will uh, if we will again get uh, infected with coronaviruses and how, how realistic is it that we will be wearing masks for 
how long do you think we're going to be wearing face masks for? Like, I think that face masks are a very good idea, especially in winter seasons, because we even seen the uh, lower levels of infections with uh, influenza or, or other cold uh, viruses. So that was, that was very good. Uh, although I think that when it goes to this pandemic, probably we will need to wear masks for uh, at least until a certain level of population will be vaccinated. Uh, so we will protect risk groups uh, and also, it, so this level is around 75% uh, of the population according to the models at the moment.